Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Next Door NetAdmin. Today, I thought I'd talk a little bit about two different ways that you can get more use out of a piece of hardware. I'm pretty sure you already know what it is. One way is virtual machines, and one way is containers. But what's the actual difference between virtual machines and containers? What is a container? There's lots of different solutions for containerization out there and just as many solutions for virtualization. So what are the advantages of one over the other? Where do you want to use one over the other? First, let's talk about what the difference is between these two things. The first solution is conceptually very easy to understand, and that's just a virtual machine. And it works pretty much exactly as you would expect. You're taking the concept of a physical machine and just implementing it virtually. This means that you may need to emulate some of your hardware. As far as the virtual machine can see, it has a hard drive, it has a CPU, it has a network card, it has RAM, it has all the pieces of hardware that it requires. And so when you have a virtual machine, that's just it. It's virtual hardware, and then you install an operating system onto that, and as far as it can see, it is its own machine. That's just how it is, and then it works that way. That also means that you need to install updates to the operating system on a virtual machine. You may need to install new versions of an operating system in order to keep it current, or just build another virtual machine and move all your services to that. Containerization is a little different. Whereas with a virtual machine, you have a completely separate operating system every single time, and each operating system has its own hardware that it can manage without concerning itself with anything else, a container does not have an operating system. A container depends on the host operating system, or the kernel, to run the software that is within the container. The container just contains the user section programs that the kernel is needing to execute. Now, typically your container will include support applications. Let's say you're looking for a web application. Okay, your container may also include Apache so that you have a web server. Your container may include MySQL if it needs a database as well. Your web, con your container may also include PHP so that you've got the language available that all the files are running in. A container may include all of these things, but it doesn't include the operating system. It has to rely on the host operating system to run the software in the container. Containers still have a hard drive, essentially. But because they're not managing it directly, they have a file system inside the container for their own software. But then how do you actually run a database? A container is a self-contained unit. If the database is in that container, then what happens when you download a new version of the container? You don't have that database anymore. So with a container, you also have interfaces to the host file system so that a container can store data outside of its container. And then when that particular container is a drop-in replacement on a new version, it can just reach out to the same location on the host file system and get the data that it's looking for, whether that's a database or certificates or whatever else it needs. And with networking, typically speaking, a container will bridge its networking, at least partially, to the host operating system. It'll say, okay, port 443, I want to forward that 
into this particular container so that HA proxy or Apache or whatever is doing this website that I'm using as an example here has access to receive traffic that's bound to it. You can't forward that to multiple containers at once. Obviously only every container is only going to be able to use one port or rather, excuse me, <clears throat> a single port will only be able to be forwarded to one container at a time. There we go. But there's, you know, some other things that you can do about this. So there in a nutshell is the main difference between virtual machines and containers. Virtual machines have their own quote unquote hardware and they manage it directly. They are an operating system. They are everything from the ground up and it, it looks, it just looks like hardware. So why do you use that? Well, a virtual machine requires a little less modification. As far as your applications can see, they're running on just another server. It doesn't need to be packaged up or have any of that. It just has the full resources of the operating system. It's also heavily isolated from the host. It, you've essentially got your virtual hardware. It's being emulated on a hardware level and that's it. The host does not have to fiddle around with the inner workings of the guest operating system. And the guest operating system cannot meddle with the host either. It's a very strong separation. And any other virtual machines, they're running in their own hardware. They've got their own network cards, their own IP addresses, their own firewalls. Everything is just completely separated which means that you have better isolation and better restrictions, shall we say, uh, from one machine to the next. So if I want to give a vendor access to completely manage everything to do with their app in a virtual environment, a virtual machine might be a good way to do that. A disadvantage to this is every virtual machine is running its own operating system. This might mean that you have six different copies of Windows running. You have the advantages of better isolation. You have the advantages of greater, um, stronger barriers between separate applications because they've got their own separate hardware and the vendors or whoever else needs to access it can only access that particular machine. And within that machine, they can go crazy. The cost of that is more computing time being spent on running multiple copies of an operating system. They all have to be kept secured, which means they all have to have patching set up. And every single one of them is going to download patches and everything else. So better security and less um, better security, better compatibility to some extent because it's an unmodified operating system, but you need more resources to run it. Bit of a downside. Um, containers, on the other hand, they don't have an operating system. That's one of their biggest advantages. If you have several different containers, you can just slot them all in and there's still only one operating system. It's very convenient to be able to extend a system by just dropping a container in there each time. Some downsides, because each container is built with its own support software in mind, you might have a bit more of a mixed experience in some respects. Maybe one application developer decides that they're going to include PHP, Apache, and MySQL all in a single container. So it's just one thing that you have to install and go. Maybe another vendor says, you know what? 
I bet we're part of a lot of things that need sequel. So let's just say that there's sequel somewhere and uh, you just tell us where it is on the network and we'll just reach out to your own sequel. And so they'll build their container without sequel in it. Okay. And then your sequel might be in another container of, of its own that has to be accessible on the network and all the other containers can talk to it. Maybe. If you don't have that, then you might have two or three containers that are running their own versions of MySQL because it's been included in their container. And you might have a MySQL container that is separate because one of your other containers requires a separate service to talk to. It's not built in. Containers are also very much not something that most people are supposed to meddle with. They're intended to be self-contained. You just install the container and off you go. You tell it what it's, you know, what ports are forwarded to it. You determine where it has a, a section of your host file system if it needs that. But otherwise, you don't mess with it so much. This is both a benefit and a drawback. The benefit is, hey, the developer, the application developer, has already decided what all the bits and pieces are that are needed, and they've included that in the container for you. You don't have to worry about, oh dear, if I update PHP, does that work with this application? Maybe there's a version of SQL that I should avoid because it causes problems. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's built into the container, ideally. And then the developer takes care of making sure that everything works and you can just drop it in and go. On the other hand, if something breaks, you, the administrator, have very limited ability to go in there, figure out what broke, and fix it which means you're kind of relying on the developer to have done all of that work and make sure that there's no bugs in it. If there's a bug, you're kind of stuck waiting around until somebody pushes out a new version of the container and there's nothing else you can do about it. Isolation is also not as strong as in a virtual machine. With a container, like I said, if you have port 443, well, okay, so you have port 443 on a single connection. Does that go to container A or container B? It can only go to one. You might have multiple connections available, multiple IP addresses. Cool. This is not the same thing as a virtual switch that you would have multiple virtual machines connected to, each with their own virtual network card, and therefore each one has its own IP address, and your one physical NIC essentially becomes like a trunk port leading to the virtual switch. In a containerized system, again, you only have one operating system, and that's the host operating system. And then it manages each one of these compartmented file systems and all of that can blend over into the host's file system for durable storage. And they all have to share the networking connection and figure that all out. So it's not as simple, I would say. Conceptually, very simple. Everything is self-contained, drop it in and off you go. From an administrative perspective, I'd say it has its own set of complexities that are different from a virtual machine, but there's still complexities there that you need to understand to be an effective system administrator. It's just different. So summing this up, because I don't want to take all day about it, virtual machine, strong isolation, better compatibility, because you don't have to worry about making sure that uh, everything works in a container and you don't have to rely on somebody else to build it. You can just manage it as an administrator, put an operating system in, make sure you have the right software. All right, you're done, off you go. 
and that virtual machine will be self-contained. This virtual machine will be self-contained. The drawback is you've got multiple operating systems that you have to manage and you have to keep updated. And it's up to you as the administrator to make sure that you don't update something and make it break. That's on you. Containers, the advantage is they're all completely self-contained. They don't have their own operating systems that you have to manage and, and update in multiple containers. They're just the user applications. Additional benefit, you, the administrator, don't have to worry about making sure that everything is compatible. All you need to do is download the latest update to the container, plug it in, off you go. Downside of that, you still have the complexities of making sure that the containers don't trample over each other's feet and making sure that the containers aren't fighting for the same port numbers or same resources. You might still have multiple copies of applications. You just don't have multiple operating systems to deal with. So yeah, pluses and minuses to both. Common container applications are things like Docker or Kubernetes. Docker is very well known. Uh, Kubernetes also fairly well known, although I think that's much more of an enterprise level thing. I have not had direct contact with Kubernetes, um, but I know that Azure offers it. And I know that Canonical, the makers of Ubuntu, they definitely support Kubernetes clusters. TrueNAS Scale used to be built very much on Kubernetes and they're now moving to Docker. Um, I have had actual experience with Docker. I have built my own Docker containers. I have updated Docker containers. I've had to manage Docker containers. So in that respect, Kubernetes for me is a level above that even. <laughs> Common virtual machines, Again, something that you're probably already familiar with, Hyper-V on the Microsoft side. VMware used to be really good until Broadcom bought it. Um, on the open source side, you have hypervisors such as KVM or Kimu or Zen. Proxmox uh, VE runs on KVM and Kimu to, to do its uh, virtualizations. And XCPNG, I don't remember exactly what it uses for its hypervisor, but it's, you know, another hypervisor focused operating system that you can then create virtual machines on and run your fleet of VMs that way. There's lots of different ways of doing this, but conceptually, it all begins with understanding a difference between virtual machines and containers. So there you go. Hopefully this has been a useful little breakdown for you. If you have thoughts on other things that you would like me to talk about or demonstrate, feel free to let me know right down there in the comments section. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching. I am your next door net admin, and we will see you next time.